So I'm here to actually part my experiences as the world is witnessing as to how terrorism is growing. So I will actually briefly speak on terrorism, uh, basically covering the old definition, then what happened in the meantime, how it has been transformed from a, a definition which is a conventional definition and how it has crossed the umbrella and gone to the state level. Then I would like to discuss what are the blunders which have been committed by our leaderships. Because this growth of terrorism, I think we all world leaders are responsible for it. I confess it, if somebody can challenge me, I'll prove them wrong. Because I have got, principally speaking, solid evidence for what I'm saying. And I'll share with you those in one line. And when you go back to your rooms, do search, do think that what I said, is it right or not right? So your excellencies and uh, very, very prominent journalists here, including my friend, Mr. Saleem, and of course, uh, at this point of time, when you are studying, you have the urge to learn. And therefore, the correct, correct perspective should be there. I know that India and Pakistan are always loggerhead. I will not discuss much. But I will discuss only what is good for India and Pakistan. How should we proceed? Because tomorrow, these countries are going to be in your hand. And perhaps one sentence given by me give you a thought as to how to proceed further in the world. The world has become a small globe. It's a global village. And social media, TV channels, screens have brought you very close. So I'm very happy that uh, media from BBC, including Ms. Hashmi and uh, all other friends from other channels, including our university student from Punjab. So let me give you as to how the world got entangled into this whole situation. If you take back the history of terrorism starting from Japan, you know that the gas was leaked in the underground uh, railway station and how many people were killed, and then it went to Germany. And I think you all know what is terrorism. So I'll, I'll not discuss much of the definition, but I'll come straight away as to how it started. You know it very well, the World War II. Post-World War II, that was the <coughs> actual time when terrorism took birth in a real sense. And they are the dirty tricks played by the Italian agencies, which make the country fight, which create groups, due to geopolitical situations, to get the geopolitical gains. Starting from that, the first blunder ever made was from USSR. When USR, USSR decided to attack Afghanistan, and we all know that they took over, what was the reason behind it? And now it has unfolded. And that very attack, in fact, disintegrated uh, Russia. I mean, so USSR was disintegrated because the situation played by his other certain country lured them in and then they had fight. So when we talk of this, they are all geopolitical intrigues. And you know that what US has did, and we are equally, uh, as a Pakistani, I will say, yes, we were actually pushed into it. And uh, this is my personal experience at that point of time, I was a deputy director of FIA, a junior officer, and I was watching not as a policy maker, but as a policy implementer. So I remember very well that a center was created in Peshawar, and all jihadis, disgruntled elements, those who had actually fled away from their countries, and they were in Canada, they were in Middle East, they were in Europe, they were in everywhere in the world. And they were recruited. After the recruitment, they were brought in to Afghanistan via Pakistan. And of course, 
they were registered there. They were trained. They were given military training. And then accordingly, they were launched there. Now question is, what was that necessary to bring the jihadis in and have the fight? Because the America did not want to come as such openly. And they used this element of the religion. Unfortunately, if you see worldwide, religion is something which is exploited the most. You have seen in Ireland what, had hap what happened here, Protestants and the, and the Catholics. And of course, you see Sri Lanka, what happened there. You go into Philippines, you see the same thing. You go to uh, Thailand, you have this conflict. So these conflicts are there because of some of the religious, not compulsion, but the engineered program to change certain geopolitical gains. Having said so, now these, these militants, these jihadis, trained jihadis turned out to be actually the one of those who fought against USSR and you saw USSR it defeated and of course America decided to ditch them. And how they were ditched, they didn't accept it. I in my capacity at that point of time, I was director of FIA, Peshawar, those friends from Pakistan. When I say Peshawar, I was the head of the FIA, is a Federal Investigation Agency equivalent to the American FBI. So at that point of time, I saw the transition of the power from going from the whole situations and where Hikmat Yar, Rubani, and everybody took over the government. And then how they got disintegrated and it gave birth to Taliban. And these are those Talibans, those of Fani who were trained, and also those militants, which are brought in from abroad and they were put into it. Now, after America left and they had no other way to survive, so they became Taliban. They actually also become, became, you know, they found a kind of uh, their livelihood out of terrorism. Like the petty crimes, of course, they got involved like a mercenaries. And time had not gone far. And these Taliban were adopted by Osama bin Laden. And that you know <coughs> came out to be by the name of Al Qaeda. Now, what is Al Qaeda? How? It transformed. The register which was being maintained to bring the jihadis in Peshawar and on the bordering area where they used to register the name of those jihadis, that register is called Al-Qaeda. Those who are sitting in Arabic speaking, they know Al-Qaeda means the elementary book. So that Al-Qaeda was actually the basic register for registration of those, those jihadis. And this name of Al-Qaeda was given after that register. And who wrote it? Al Zwari. Amal Zwari, he was uh, a very young boy at that time when I met him. I interrogated him and interrogated him. In fact, when I was deputy director of FIA in connection with something else. So, please. And they very categorically stated America promised us jobs. America brought us here, and when they dumbed us, we had no other option to do it. And you know, the, the same thing I had learned personally in my investigation of Yusuf Ramzi. Those who have some knowledge of uh, the development of the, these uh, terrorists, Yusuf Ramzi was, in fact, the first attacker, bomber in the World Trade Center. I arrested him from Pakistan and we extradited him according to the law. And that gentleman did not open his mouth for one year. I, along with one of my investigators, for the first time I interviewed, and he was so open, he said, Sir, uh, you take me to a box because whatever I speak in the hall is going to be used against me. But if I go to the box, it will not be used against me. And he said, I want you to actually blow Brooklyn Village, Brooklyn Bridge instead of World Trade Center. So he was so convinced. So I asked him a question what I want to emphasize. He said, till such time, 
the brutalities in the world that do not start. My mother was killed. My maternal uncle was killed during the Iraq war. He said, I want to take revenge. What comes in? And well, anyway, you saw he was convicted later on. His two maternal uncles, Khalid ul Sheikh and Zahid ul Sheikh. Khalid Sheikh was arrested from Pakistan and he is now serving prison in, in America. And uh, Zahid ul Sheikh is at large. So these were the groups and they were very close to Osama bin Laden. And Osama bin Laden was not only close to these people, but he was very close to Yemen and Somalia, Sudan. And of course, uh, the, he recruited people from there. And he also made the entire team who killed Anwar Sadat, Jamaa Islamiya. So you see, all these bunch of people, they got together, and it was our bad luck in Pakistan, they got, got together there. And that's where the Pakistani trouble started. And right from that day, I assure you that we did not have peace. We had the clash and cop culture, drug in the form of Hiran cave. I'm sorry for apologies from my general friends. They brought the first missionary to refine Hiran. And we detected for the first time at Islamabad airport mm -hmm. at the point of time. And of course, the same Hiran was used for the USSR soldiers as well. So you see the tricks which keep going and playing. And when I'm using the drug, I say that tiger, you know, tigers, they were also into drugs because they were creating their funds by the smuggling of drugs. And a famous name, infamous name, Golden Triangle, they were using. So the terrorists actually get the funding from the certain individuals, certain countries, and also they generate their funds from illegal means, and which you call terrorist financing, and of course, illegal transactions. And after 9-11, when it, it, it went to the world in a large scale, and of course the definition of, uh, <coughs> of terrorism did not come, but the definition of money laundering did come. And today, as I speak to you, I mean with all powerful countries, <coughs> our UNO, we do not have a single convention on ter convention on, on, on terrorism. There are 19 conventions, and they're all scattered and polarized. And if, if somebody asks that what law should a country adopt, they do not have one law. So that's what I have been actually emphasizing, advocating, that we should have one convention. And when I talk of one convention, then I talk of interfaith harmony. Because the way the religions have been expanded, <coughs> you have seen it here, Taliban, they, are, they did not serve anything good for the Islam because they have been using suicide bombers. You and me and everybody knows that none of the religion in the world, none of the religion in the world teaches you violence. It teaches you love, affection. You talk, take Hinduism, you take Islam, you take Judaism, you take Christianity. You take any religion in the world. No religion tells you to kill somebody. And where did get these Taliban got, got, did get this kind of impression or their own uh, self-created Islam that suicidal missions are very according to Islam? We had to do a big struggle to get fatwas from the mullahs, even from other university event, and we got it that it is a haram. But it is still going on. And to your horror, you will be surprised to know that the investigation we had carried out certain suicide bombers, <coughs> which could not explode, they were sold to the Talibans, the teenagers. Uh, just a meager amount, not very big amount. Then they're trained. So you see the poverty is the main can do for these, this, these kind of acts. Because if you see the whole world, draw map, you see the terrorism expanding where there's a the poverty. And I'm sorry, we all written sitting here. I have failed to understand till today. If you see the world map, why only the pockets of Islam, wherever there is Islam government or Islamic pocket or a country, the terrorism is there. 
That's what when the Mr. President Donald Trump spoke against Islam and he said Islamic terrorism. And I remember I had gone to attend his uh, first oath and I delivered a lecture in, in, in uh, I think, uh, one of the universities here, uh, London University. And up from there, I addressed him and I also wrote him. I said, not Islamic terrorism. And Mr. President, your, my religion does not teach violence. So I advise you, fight this terrorism with Muslims, not against the Muslims. I wrote him a letter. I sent him tweets, but I'm glad that I got a call from the White House. They said, it's sensible. And then I also referred a international resolution in Philippines, Baguio, in 1994, where it was decided at the level of international community that no religion will be condemned and neither is going to be called Christian terrorism or Islamic terrorism or Hindu terrorism. It is extremist. It's extremism. And I'm glad it is there. And of course, we'll continue with this. Having said so, when these Talibans came in, Al-Qaeda came in, and of course, uh, how things happened, 9-11 occurred, and 9-11 in fact changed the, to the face of the world. And you know the mistake and the blunder which was made by USSR was again repeated by USA. And I have been vocally saying worldwide, even in America, CNN and BBC, I have been giving these interviews, that this was blunder. And now, <coughs> USS realizes that it was a blunder. Now, after spending trillions of dollars, they have not been able to achieve what they wanted to achieve. Now they think that, let's go for a dialogue. Because bullet is not the answer. Bullet is not the solution. They have seen it in Vietnam. They have seen in African countries, they have seen even Cuba, they have seen in Venezuela, and they have experienced in also Afghanistan. So let's hope the sense prevails and we go for a dialogue. And I really sincerely pray that the dialogue with Pakistani uh, high ups and the government and all concerned are assisting USA for a dialogue between US and the Afghan Talibans. If it happens, very good. But with a little experience of mine, I can say it looks difficult because America doesn't want to leave even today all those uh, bases and maybe partly withdraw. And the Afghan Talibans want full, full withdrawal and will create a situation at that point of time. And then these Talibans, Al-Qaeda, the way they create a havoc in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, I think it will take many years, to be very honest, to come back to the normal situation. Because we are till today feeling the touch. Our economy is destroyed. We have lost billions of dollars in terms of logistics. And we have lost, in fact, 70,000 innocent citizens we have lost 10,000 soldiers, and yet <coughs> Pakistan is seen to be a suspect. My green passport was seen. The first impression goes is, they must be a terrorist. Unfortunately, it is not so. So why it is this? We have given our lives. We have fought for you. We fought the war for the international community. We were there with you to fight. But the result or the compensation or the appreciation you have seen what we have. I don't want to go into details because America has got many darlings. We may not be the that big darling as the other people do, but I would like to remember, remind them, look, if you leave once a friend and you ditch once a friend, maybe that friend will not come back to you, but other will also learn the lesson that this person or this country is not a friend. Now I go a little forward to tell you how the situation got deteriorated. Uh, you know, after the, uh, the murder of uh, Osama bin Laden, the, the focus was shifted. And I remember I met the Saudi king, 
and I had about half an hour meeting with him. So I briefed him certain things. He said, I would like to sit with you in the whole cabinet. I remember Prince Mugran, uh, then Crown Prince, uh, and the Interior Minister. We spent three and a half hours together. I gave him the briefing, and I predicted that now the terrorists have started moving to Yemen. All those, I gave them the name Afro Arab terrorists because Africans. Arabs and they had formed kind of a syndicate and I said they are going to be used in Yemen and it happened within three months there was attack on the deputy interior minister the number of bombing was done there so the shift was done that's a big question okay, who shifted that because if you have to travel tomorrow to your country you need ticket your parents will give your friends will give and they move in groups they, they, have, they need money to live. They need a shelter to have, uh, to spend life there, maybe four months, six months, six years. So you saw that and it happened. Now coming on to this, Taliban and the terrorists from Middle East, they had a big nexus. And uh, it's my, again, personal experience, and I've seen the evidence myself, Abu Bakr Baghdadi. He was trained in Khost for six months and when he goes back to Iraq and you know how Daesh was created. Again I say the biggest blunder ever done by America was to disband the Iraqi army. You do not have the force to protect or to fight against. So how can you control a crime or any anti-state movement? So we saw one of the American senators meeting Abu Bakr Baghdadi in the jail. Seven and a half thousand militants are let off. And of course, what was created again in Rajan? Shia Sunni. There was a statement from one of the very famous Ayatollah and stated that it should not be fair. Everybody was talking about it. But the first massacre in Fallujah and then the way they took over and wherever there was a population of Shia, they used to take those people on the top floor and say, okay, say Kalma, La La La, Muhammad Rasulullah, and they will just shoot him on the, on the head and say, Allah Akbar, and down. Are you telling me the guy who's killing, he's a Muslim. The guy who's been killed, he's a Muslim. He's reciting Quran. He's reciting Kalma on both sides. Who should we ask? So there is some kind of a conspiracy which was going on and the consp conspiracy was unfolded. And you must have seen all of you when they decided to go into Syria. And before happening this, I'm again a witness to one of the things that certain Middle Eastern countries wanted in fact the UNO forces to go to Syria for attack which of course Pakistan opposed. I played a key role in it, and uh, we did guard that resolution about it. And we were totally against, we knew it, that there will be children's dead bodies, women's dead bodies, and the world is going to view it wrongly. You have seen what ha happened in, in uh, Syria, who created it? the same dash the same dash we talk of terrorism but here I say geopolitical gains and interests so whoever did it of course I don't have to say much but Tony Blair is on record where he has stated openly that it was a blunder it was a blunder it will continue to be a blunder in the history Again, I will tell you in a personal experience, Shaheed Motrama Bainzir Bhatto, who had dressed from here, I feel honored today at standing at the same place and dressing the most prominent future leaders. I sent, BB sent the message via me to President Saddam through the ambassador of 
a rock in UAE. I met him and uh, I said, this is what we want. Can you expose your weapons of mass destruction site to the Americans? And they said, no, we don't have any. And on in writing, it was conveyed. I came back to Bibi. I said, this is what they say. She spoke to somebody there. And they said, we'll get back to you. And then within 24 hours, they said, it's too late. We have decided to attack. We have decided to attack. So now if it, they were predetermined to do it. So that means there was something else. And what was that something else? That was Arab Spring. Arab Spring was initiated. And it was initiated with Husni Mubarak. And at that point of time, the entire Middle East did not want Husni Mubarak to be eliminated from the bar. But you see, saw how it happened. The Muslim Brotherhood came. Jamaya Islamia came. And uh, I will not take the name of the Prime Minister, but you know how uh, he was toppled, how he was humiliated. And second person, of course, you saw somebody else is Iraqi president. And third, what happened the Libyan president? I've, I've written a book, Dash, which of course, uh, it speaks all about it, all about it. And uh, I'm sorry, I'll not be, I'll be able to give you the copy of the book, which is written about these war doctrine. And it is not against anybody, but I've just collected the facts, nothing else. I'm not speaking anything on that, because I know my very lovely dear friend from India are also here. And I do not want to say anything which hurt anybody. There are many speeches come from India, many speeches go from here. This is the politics, but I would not like to play politics here. Here I'm here to tell you the facts, not a blame game. So in this one, I have actually stated as to how, according to my experience, how Dash was created. And what was the agenda of Dash? And how it has traveled from Iraq to Afghanistan, to Turkey, and then to Afghanistan. I have given the location of those training centers in Afghanistan as to how they are being trained. I have evidence in this one that even the Chinese are trained in it. Iranis are trained. To your, to your horror, even people from Maladi are there being trained. So all those jails I have summed it up as a textbook. Not a blame game, but a textbook. So when students like you read, they have some material to read and of course to refer it. And you know what happened, that how that went to Sri Lanka via India. And it's not me who's saying, the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka and the President of Sri Lanka on record. Now how they have gone there, Indian government, I'm sure is explaining, but I have also given some facts in this one. Um, I will be sending you about 50 copies, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, because I couldn't get it because I came in hurry uh, because of the situation back home I could not uh, come earlier as, as I was to be here on the 15th. Having said so, the terrorism, the way it is growing, it needs to be kept here. It needs to be blocked. The question arises how to block it. Unfortunately, our own problems in terms of politics we want to look like SHO of the world. Sometimes senior SHO, or sometimes junior SHO. And those who are from other countries, I'll say it's called station house officer. And it is like your complaint officer in your area. And he's very powerful. He has authority to even lock up anybody. <coughs> so everybody, and the big boys, want to be really SHOs. So what I mean to say, it's important which I mentioned to you okay, where the leadership actually committed blunders. And those blunders are attributed <coughs> even today in enhancing terrorism in the world. Now somebody has to come forward. And I expect the youth to come forward. Because youth has to play a role in every country. There is no law. We have to bring the law. And inshallah, when I go back, I'm going to make another effort. In my parliament, at least, we send a resolution to you, I know. And I'm sorry to say 
the most redundant department on record, I say, is UNO. They are the last one to know what has happened. But for the I had met the Secretary General of UNO. I once traveled with him. I said, what do you do? Why don't you, why don't you work? He said, nobody allows me to work. So I resign and go home. <laughs> Tell the world that you can't do it. So unfortunate that the custodian of the peace of the world feels helpless and handcuffed. So how do you, where are you going to go and talk? So we have nobody to tell knock and get this is what is happening. Unfortunately, I'll just name few things for your record. By the way, I'm speaking extempore. I've written a speech for you, for your reference. You. There are about 22 points in which I have elaborated everything and I own every word of that. So I said, well, I speak, you know, so maybe we need something for record. And I also consulted your very able president and he endorsed this idea that I should distribute uh, one speech. So uh, by the time I'll <coughs> finish the speech, we'll have all that. Now I'll start with that. What are those mistakes which have actually is destroyed us? First is to pay comment. We all sitting here, where you're having a chat, you're having a coffee. You never ask which religion you are. You don't ask him, are you Shia? Are you Muslim? Are you a Christian? Are you a Hindu? You just only see and say that he is a human being. That's it. And that's what God tells you. Nothing is bigger than humanity. If you see Bible, you see Quran, you see Buddha, even you see in your even Hinduism. You can't kill a kida, you know, uh, any, but any small even lizard. What to talk of human being? And even Islam says that if you kill one human being, you have you kill the whole human being. And the biggest crime in our religion, almost in every religion, is murder. So when it is a biggest crime, how can terrorists opt this option with them? How can they interfere God's duty and they start killing people themselves because they think that uh, somebody dreamt? And I will tell you one incident. I visited uh, uh, this place, Malakanswar, and I went to a hall. And literally, I'm telling you what was there. There were like uh, paintings, uh, like, you know, honey is flowing. And then, whose are there? The, the most beautiful women, which. Uh, uh, they had been promising them and then of course other thing was that if you if you are a suicide bomber and you kill people you will be able to take your 70 relatives in Jannah and they were so stupid and I have videos on record I got them recorded who were, <coughs> were alive they would say take the name of your uh, family members after you have blown up, you would like them to see them in Jannah. And related to that, there was a one incident war factory in, uh, near Pindi, there is, we have a city. And uh, one of the guy came out, with fully prepared as a you know, suicide bomber. And before they take bath, white shalwat ways, and you know, white shuffle, and uh, he's prepared to go to Jannah. Uh, as per the correction of the guy. And he decided not to go to Jannah. He went to the near, nearest bathroom. He tried to take it off. Anyway, the people got him. I have seen that person myself. He's in still in a Jala jail. And he said, well, why I stopped and I didn't do it? Because my handler said, when you go there, you will see the white guys there. And you will blow there and you'll straight go to Jannah. He said when he went there, he didn't see any white guy. He said all people in Shalwak, he said, why am I killing these, uh, uh, you know, English guys? So that kind of a perception is created. And of course we traced how he was recruited, who did it. And there was Kari Usman. And uh, his, when we got some people arrested, he on record said that give me a boy or a girl, 15 days he or she will tell that I want to be a suicide bomber. I wanted to go in more details. 
I mean, any natural human being, the best, of course, your precious thing is your life. But what they do, they, in fact, inject various drugs. And when this incident happened, what they started doing was suicide bombing plus remote control bomb. If the suicide bomber does not press the button, the guy waiting little near will press his remote control. And that incident happened, if you recall, when the attack was on, uh, you know, uh, one of ANP uh, leader. Uh, but he survived. The suicide bombers were actually blown up from a distance. So having said so, this is the, actually not only in Pakistan, now coming on to Iraq. Iraq started with it. And uh, they recruited people. They went everywhere. And let me tell you, they are no Muslims. They are mercenaries. Paid on payment. And of course, they have every bad thing, whatever you mention. And it was a mistake again, a blunder. I can sit in CNN and say that who had done this blunder. And only one name. He's live if you get a chance to ask him. President Gul of Turkey. We met him. I said, Mr. President, let's not support it. Syria, you can do it by dialogue. But let's not do it. If you have a problem with Kurds, that you think that Syria is supporting poor, that's a political issue. Let's work out something. And even today, in my writings, in my speeches, openly I say a similar thing to Pakistan and India. Let's sit together on the table. We're educated. Let's find out a solution. If you stop our water, your own brother and sister will, will die thirsty. If something happened in Kashmir, or some people are being killed with terrorism in Pakistan or India, it's humanity. Let's think over it. Let's stop it. And here, with reference to President Gore, I would like to mention you one thing more. Mr. Chandambaram, who was the Interior Minister of India, I was his counterpart. He visited me. In the beginning, he was lucky to see me. And I met him. And he said, sir, I am not meeting you because you outsmart me in the press. I said, no, sir, you are my guest. You will speak. And if you allow me to speak, only then I'll speak. And after the meeting, I said, we have suffered. Because we stopped, we did not stop the Talbans. We did not stop the growth of these bad guys. There's no good Taliban, there's no bad Taliban. And even President Karzai said to me, yeah, there are good Taliban, we take them on board. I said, there's no good Taliban. Whoever you take on board, they are all trained terrorists and they are going to destroy you. And the same good Taliban he used to stop, they tried to kill him three times. So then I told him that you are going to get Hindu Taliban. As we got Muslim Taliban, you're going to get it. And I'm on record, you can ask him. He said, No, Excellency, I do not agree with you. We don't have. Down the line, sir, after one year, I was flying with him from New Delhi to Kathmandu. And he told me, You're right. It is true. You know, third party interference, Bombay. I mentioned David Hadley is in it. He said, no. I said, he, he is a triple agent. I gave him the, all the evidence. You know, he was arrested. He's convicted. He was interrogated in India also on, on video call. And I'm glad that the real culprits were caught. So similarly, what I said to President of Turkey, Mr. President, let's sit together and not to bring a resolution whereby you are trying to uh, set a, a precedent in your own region. And tomorrow they will be in Turkey, they will be in Saudi Arabia, and that's what I told the Saudi king. I told the similar thing to, uh, to Qatar. And then other issue came. I'm telling you all that experience because you are not going to read in books. You're not going to read in, in the newspapers. There was a serious conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And they were about to fight. So Prader Zari and me decided that uh, we should jump in. I flew to Iran. I spoke to him. But before that, I went to Saudi Arabia. I convinced them that let me do my mediation. And I'm glad that the president of Iran, who had some miscommunication, that you know this uh, Hamas. And of course, then he said uh, uh, certain groups 
they were actually favored by a certain country. And Saudi think that it's being done by Iran. And we proved our record, it was not Iran. Shai, somebody who was the opposition leader in Bahrain, he was considered to be the part of Iran, which, which was proven wrong. Thankfully, that war was averted. So what I mean to say, the conflicts keep on happening, and they are still happening, and we have to avoid it. Now, coming on to this, whatever USA has done, and how Taliban were produced, the same Taliban went and met, at that point of time, President Reagan. And uh, I remember President, you know, the President, our rep, and the, and the envoy of America, Mr. Khalid. He used to translate for them. The time passes, but they were actually given a space. And thereafter, you know what exactly happened, and I'm telling you on record today, 9-11, there was nobody from Pakistan in that terrorist attack. There was nobody from Afghanistan. There was nobody from India. They're all from Middle East. But who got the touch to war? Pakistan, Afghanistan. And the background is different. Now I'm covering it because the Cold War. The Cold War are coming up right from the World War II. You saw China versus America. You know when the Chinese got a very high-flying spy plane and got that down. And you know what is happening between Russia and USA. So all these conflicts and their own issues, these things are created. And now I say terrorism is a tool of terror. And unfortunately, it's being used by the states. When we say terrorist financing by the states, I mean to say they are backed. How they backed, you know it fully well. What happened in New Zealand? You, you have seen the statement of President Donald Trump, which is coming up like a white terrorism. <coughs> so if you see that Facebook and his statement of the gentleman, the terrorist, he is trying to bring a war between the two civilizations, Christianities and Muslims. When the, when the New Zealand incident happened, I'm on record, and I stated the next vulnerable points are Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Why I said it? Because both places, Christians and Muslims, the poor minorities are living. They will be attacked. And you saw what happened in, in Sri Lanka. So this is a third party doing something, engineering something on the you know, future for their own motives. So similarly, when I talk about this uh, corporation, if you see, when you lease out your official duties, official works to private parties, I'm mentioning a name, Prince Eric, who was running a company called Blackwater. This Blackwater fought a war in Afghanistan. It went to Africa, and you must have seen the name of Victor Boot, one of the gun runner, the world's infamous lower flyer. He was later on convicted. So what I mean to say, that these all things are done with a special purpose. So that's what, if you recall in Pakistan, I banned 700 diplomats. When it came to my notice, I said, oh, you, we have 10 or 15 diplomats. How can you have 700 uh, diplomatic passports? So I got a survey done in Islamabad and uh, issued the order they should leave. <coughs> I remember Mr. Holbrook, uh, the then envoy of America, came to me with the message of his president. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, they are working <laughs> for us. I said, you're working for you, not working for Pakistan. You have, let us say, 20 people, I'll give you five more, and I won't. And I put the restriction at that point of time, and I know for the next six months, no American delegation came to call on me because they were not happy. I said, no, I don't care. 
as long as the law of my country. I said, if I ask you to give 700 visas for my diplomats, will you give? Let's sign an agreement. I will also send 700 people and give them the diplomatic visa. I'll be very happy. So see, this Eric, the Prince Eric, Black Prince is called in the world. He has created a havoc <coughs> in Sudan, in Somalia, in Somaliland, and there are many other countries, started from Ivory Coast to everywhere he's found doing all these things. Where was the bank? Where was the money coming from? So somebody is destabilizing certain regions exactly the way today South Asia is being destabilized. What's happening in our Baluchistan? Who's supporting those terrorists? I mean, it's very easy to say, and uh, while having a hot coffee or watching a TV, 15 people died in Pakistan, 300 people died in Sri Lanka, 200 people died in India. But don't we feel that they're human beings? They are related to somebody. They are sons, their fathers, their mothers, their children, unfortunately. You know, because geopolitical interest has to be met. And for that, you know the dirty tricks played by the world intelligence agencies. I recommend you to read a book for Phillips and Eggies. This guy has written a rundown, a countdown as to why he left CIA. And he writes that white, while America is friendly with Churchill, they still put in trees. And what happens during that time with the Italian president, that is also mentioned. I don't want to make, take you a lot of time, but read these books, you will know. And these are the dirty tricks of the intelligence agencies. And I hope these dirty tricks which have been played in the past. And today, the world is not safe. And it's becoming less safer and safer every passing day. Similarly, Al-Qaeda and Daesh got a, a good coordination. And Abu Bakr Baghdadi was actually given a kind of a title of a young soldier, no less than Amin Zwari. And of course, uh, Osama himself, and what they are doing at present, you know it. And uh, it is on record. If you go see the archives, even Secretary Hillary Clinton said, yes, we actually initiated the jihadism. And we nursed Al-Qaeda. What else you want? And that's the same thing on the Congress. It was testified that it was nobody else but America. So I wonder, you will wonder, the world wonders. On one side, you are trying to stop the terrorism. The other side, you are supplying what is required for by the terrorist. So there's no free lunch in the world. I asked this question many times to the American high ups. I said, if one Pakistani or one Afghani he is very sick. He lands in America and he requests that he has to have an operation, allow me to go in. You will not allow him. You will send him back. And here, you come and do your way. So why do they, they do their way? Because they are called geopolitical interests of the world powers. And I'm sorry, not only here, I have been saying all these things vocally. Somebody has to speak it. I have experienced it. That's why I'm telling you everything this way. Similarly, if you see, if we respect, I said the UN is the most redundant organization in the world. I tell you, if UNO was active, if UNO was going, doing its duty, today we would not be fighting, oh sorry, we would not be fighting with India today. The issue would have been resolved. So I think I'll stop it here. I started. Let's have that uh, with your permission. Or you can serve here if you like. Whatever.